Okay, so I'm going to start the formal introduction now. Um, I'm Suzanne Newcomb, and I'm the current honorary director of INFORM, and I'm also a lecturer in religious studies at the Open University. Um, many of you are regulars at INFORM, and you'll be aware that INFORM is an independent educational charity providing information about minority religions and sects, which we aim to be as accurate, up to date, and evidence based as possible. We exist to prevent harm based on misinformation about minority religions and sects by bringing the insights and methods of academic research, particularly those of the social sciences, into the public domain. So INFORM was founded in 1988 by Professor Eileen Barker at the London School of Economics with direct support from the UK government. Um, we moved to the Department of Theology and Religious Studies at King's College London in 2018. And please feel free to email INFORM um, and get in touch after the seminar. If you have any thoughts, questions, um, compliments or complaints, we'd love to hear any feedback and ideas about what we could do better next time, ideas for future seminars, um, that kind of thing. So the format of this online seminar is based on the successful approach that was pioneered by Professor Eileen Barker um, in our face-to-face -face seminars. Um, what we try to do is to bring people together from a variety of personal and professional experiences who have a shared interest in the theme of relevance to new and minority religions and to try to get them in the same room talking to each other. Um, and we also really try to get academics talking in dialogue to the people who they study um, and the people their research affects in various ways and to try to um, aid all of our knowledge um, by creating a dialogue and asking new questions and seeing things from someone else's perspective. So we're gonna be recording the speaker view of this session. You can see the recording button um, and making it available on YouTube afterwards. It might be a good idea to pin the speaker view for your own viewing experience um, and also to make sure you're muted so you don't accidentally come on. Um, we'll take questions from the audience at the final section. And so to ask a question, um, it's best either to raise your hand and or type in the chat box your question. And we'll try to fit as many of you in as possible. If you want to ask a question anonymously, you can um, private message me, Suzanne Newcomb, in the um, box instead of to everyone, just pull down to Suzanne Newcomb and I'll ask a, a question without saying who was asking it. Um, you can also email me, but I, it's probably better to, to chat, use the chat box in this instance. Um, so all speakers are going to have 10 minutes for their sections. And if a speaker goes on for too much longer than that, I'm going to have to interrupt and ask you to wrap things up. And there's not a really subtle way to do this on Zoom. I can't like hold up a little sign discreetly. So you'll have to um, excuse me and please don't take offense. OK, so that's the housekeeping. Um, today, it's my pleasure to introduce um, our online seminar, which is curated by Edward Graham Hyde and Alan Thomas, who are two early career scholars who are doing um, a piece of research considering contemporary scholarly and popular uses of the word cult, as well as the framing of social scientific studies on new and minority religions more generally. And this is part of a, a bigger project that they've been working on for some time. Um, and I will hand it over to Ed and Alec. Alec. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much, Suzanne. And hello, everyone. Good evening, Maswatha, wherever you're joining us for a variety of time zones. So good morning to those uh, speakers of ours who have very kindly got up early and are spending their breakfast with us. Um, it's an absolute pleasure and an honour to uh, co-host today's event with my colleague Edward Graham Hyde, or Ed, as I'll be referring to him throughout my introduction. And uh, it's very exciting as well for us to be working with Inform, um, because, of course, we all know the groundbreaking and important uh, work that Inform does. But on a personal note, uh, Inform has also been instrumental in transforming me as a researcher and the opportunities, <clears throat> excuse me, that they have provided as well. So thank you to Inform and also thank you to our speakers it looks like this evening is going to be a very interesting event, and thank you to them for joining us. So as uh, Suzanne just alluded to, this evening we're discussing cultic rhetoric in 21st century discourses. And this is a topic that has uh, interested Ed and I for the past year or so. We've been bouncing emails back and forth to each other. 
And uh, we think that it's a good time for us to revisit this topic for a number of reasons. And I think that there is no secret that cultic rhetoric, or shall we call it normative cultic language, is experiencing a resurgence of sorts. So with the complications raised by COVID-19 and conspiracies or conspiritualities in political discourses, the old terms and typologies, including cults and brainwashing in particular, are gaining a new cultural capital. So whether you very recently saw The Guardian's uh, headline that the conservative UK government is a dangerous cult, or if you saw um, Alan Johnson, the former Labour cabinet minister, describe the left-wing activist group Momentum as a little cult, these examples demonstrate the political power of cultic rhetoric. And it's an effective, albeit unsophisticated, method for political agents. These are highly charged accusations that paint a vivid picture of activists or voters who have lost a sense of reason, embraced an irrational worldview, or have simply become enamored by their leader. And these accusations are, uh, are marking a significant shift in the use of the term cults from the common association with minority religious movements to the new debates in this new world we find ourselves in surrounding religion and politics, vaccines and political movements. And Ed will give you some really interesting data in a moment that we've gathered over the past few weeks on that front. So we're hoping that this evening will uh, act as a springboard of sorts to a new book. And the book will have the same title, Cult Rhetoric in um, the 21st Century. And the purpose of the book is to reconsider the field and its future. So that ranges from contemporary contexts to new directions. And to assist that this evening, we're going to be revisiting the notion of cults from a variety of angles, both historical and contemporary, which we think will help inform future research. And before I do hand over to Ed for his part of the introduction, um, I'd like to briefly touch on uh, NRM studies and public discourse. I was very recently listening to a podcast recording of a uh, panel from committee members of the British Association for the Study of Religions. When they were discussing um, religious studies in the public domain and the idea that the study of religions has become a muted voice. In other words, scholarship within the interdisciplinary study of religion is failing to take a larger role in public discourse surrounding the category of religion and essentially not making its voice heard. And what I believe is a troubling situation for the wider study of religions is an even greater concern for those of us interested in the study of new religions, which is often positioned as a sub niche field, uh, which, in our opinion, has been further hampered by the world religions paradigm, which Ed will expand on in a moment. And I think the often sensitive nature of the subject of new religious movements, uh, in addition to the cultic rhetoric of media depiction of NRMs, calls for a carefully constructed and researched scholarship that communicates a balanced approach that, while it does not shy away from controversies, still gives that expert informed discourse to public audiences. And this is a task that's easier said than done. So to quote uh, Stephen Gregg, one of the BASR panelists in that podcast, when you're trying to explain to a journalist that actually this is complicated, that's not what a journalist wants. They want sound bites. They want public discourse about our academic disciplines to be simple and to be black and white. So based on what Stephen said there, I know that by repeating that, I am uh, preaching to the converted. Uh, for the most part, with our attendance at an informed seminar. And it goes without saying that a nuanced approach to new minority religions is not in keeping with that soundbite, black and white approach that the media tends to prefer. And this is a challenge for us moving forward in disseminating our work outside the ivory tower of academia. And it's a task that Inform itself has admirably led the way on for many years. And essentially, we need to stop locking ourselves in echo chambers. How we do that is a question I'd like us to keep in mind throughout this evening, and I'm certainly not expecting any answers either. It's a huge question of how to move forward on that front. 
And while there are a range of approaches, the approach Ed and I have adopted in our own work is to approach new religions as simply lived religions, religion as the actions, practices and beliefs of everyday people, avoiding that binary between a new religion and a world religion, a very flawed category indeed. And this is what we believe needs to be communicated to wider audiences. So thank you very much, everyone. I hope you enjoy this evening. I will now very quickly hand over to Ed. Thank you, Alex. Yes, and I'm aware of time, so I will very briefly zone in on some of the implications of cultic rhetoric resurgence in contemporary society, not for uh, minority religions specifically, but for the individual, um, which I think is something that is lacking currently um, in our in our discourse. Um, so one of the, some of the things that have emerged from our research collection together is um, is that the individual is unable to contextualize their experience or their past experience in a minority religion in any other way other than by using the world religion paradigm. And what I mean by that is that essentially leave takers from uh, minority religions will refer to their past organizations um, as cults and still hold all of the beliefs that they had. Um, even when they were in that organisation. And what they're doing there is they are recognising that the rest of society wants to distance themselves from some, something that's been labelled as cult or other, as it were, and they are now taking part in that process and doing the same thing while still holding the same beliefs. And the term, as we all know, has become a popularised word that can have different meanings depending on who's using it. Naturally, all of us in this room will probably use the word cult very differently to Joe Bloggs living in mid-Sussex, England. They are uh, different meanings behind how we use them in popular discourse and academic discourse. Um, and our recent uh, research, we are conducting a survey or have been conducting a survey um, on how the terms brainwashing, cult, minority religions and new religious, uh, new religious movements are being used by everyday people. So far, we've had 1,500 responses, and that's steadily climbing as the days go by, which we're very grateful for. And one of the unexpected findings of that isn't necessarily the data we've collected in the survey. It's actually the comments that have been made on Facebook, because we chose to advertise the survey through Facebook, and we put some money into adverts. And the comment section I'm sure you won't find this hard to believe, has been somewhat vitriolic at points. And it has been almost hijacked, in a way, uh, by anti-vaxxers, um, people who want to uh, discuss the cult of COVID and uh, the oppression of the British government in particular. And what's really coming out in these comments, the data that we're finding, to be very brief, is that these individuals are othering or belittling the opinions or the perspectives of others that they view to be weak or um, beneath them. And so cult or cultic rhetoric is being used as a way, as a weapon, yet again, but in a slightly different context to what we've previously highlighted in previous decades uh, during the historical cult wars as, as it's referred to in the literature and, and, and beyond. So, it's an interesting kind of shift in the way the rhetoric's been used in contemporary society. Ultimately, as we all know, the way that cultic, cultic rhetoric is used in popular discourse shapes understanding, can shape policy, um, and it can shape identity. And therefore, it's shaping the lived reality of religion. Now, moving forward, we need to do a couple of things, or at least in my opinion, I think we need to do a couple of things. I don't want to prescribe that for us all. I think, number one, we need to revisit these terms as they are still popularly used, and we must engage with those that use them. And it's not academics using them anymore. It is being used in popular discourse. And so we need to start engaging with everyday people and how they're using terms and start considering how we're using terms to make sure that our research is impacting contemporary society and benefiting those outside of academia as well as those within. Secondly, I think we need to uh, finally unify behind one term. 
And I'm not going to say, suggest I know what that term is. I'm currently using minority religion or live religion in my, in my research. I'm sure there's a, a debate to be had there. But I think as academics, as scholars and as people discussing this, we need to unify behind one term so that moving forward, we're all on the same page. And when we start discussing this in popular discourse, everyone knows what, we're, what we mean when we use the term, whatever term that is. And finally, I think we have to do both of those things within the context of deconstructing the world religion paradigm. Ultimately, cultic rhetoric in the 21st century is as a result of a paradigm that uses Christianity or Islam, for example, as a measuring tape. And this is too simplistic and reductionist in the study of contemporary religion. When someone is unable to refer to their past as anything other than cultic, because that's the paradigm that they've been brought up with, and that's the paradigm that is majority, majority in society, it's not helping their own understanding or shaping their own lived reality any more than it's helping us in academia. And so I think we also need to be active in making sure that we deconstruct the world religion paradigm, which is no longer or never was fit for purpose, in my opinion, and I'm sure some others here too. And I think we need to move forward on that basis together. And so tonight is a, uh, a plea for help, but also a plea for discussion. We want to open this discussion up. We want to uh, talk about the words and the terms that we're using. And moving forward, I think we can build on what's already gone before, which has been fantastic. And we can start making sure that our research is still impacting in 21st century contemporary society which has slightly shifted and is continuing to shift specifically at the moment with things like COVID as well. So I hope that's helped. I'll, um, I'll pass back to Suzanne. I hope I haven't gone over time either. That's been a fantastic introduction. Thank you both, Alan. And, uh, there's lots of really interesting um, developments and themes and concepts, which I'm sure will come out in, in discussion. So our first speaker who will have um, 10 minutes is Jay Gordon Melton, the Distinguished Professor of American Religious History at the Institute for Studies of Religion at Baylor University in Texas. He's familiar, I'm sure, to most of you here, but he's a scholar with an encyclopedic knowledge of the American religious landscape and sectarianism, both new and old. He's got over 45 books under his belt and was the founding director of the Institute for the Study of American Religions. He's also very much a veteran of the first cult wars in the 70s and 80s. And he's going to speak to us um, today uh, with the title of Californians and Communists, Inadequacies in Using the C Word in Describing Religions. Actually, Christians, Californians and Communists. Lots of C words in there. Are you there, Gordon? I am, I had to unmute myself. <laughs> Um, as we turn our attention to the current rhetoric about cults, we should be aware of the three distinct ways that we use the term in popular discourse. Uh, these uses, uh, uses originated at the end of the 19th century, and uh, just as a number of new religions were beginning to emerge in Western culture, and uh, we begin to apply the term cult to them. Of course, through the 19th century, one by one, Mormonism, spiritualism, Christian science, etc., began to make their impact. But it wasn't until the end of the century that we came up with this term cult to kind of describe all of them at once. The term itself was initially popularized by a fellow named William Irvine. Uh, he was an early fundamentalist writer, and he was writing in the context of fundamentalism, modernism, the controversy that, brought, uh, that was heating up after World War I. Uh, uh, for Irvine and his colleagues at this time, uh, the term cult meant a group that deviates from Orthodox Protestant Christianity, uh, denied Christian essentials, most notably the Trinity and the divinity of Christ. Cults were groups that uh, took Christianity and adulterated it. The defini definition for Irvine and his colleagues uh, immediately became whether or not Roman Catholicism was a cult, 
or liberal Protestantism was a cult. And uh, each writer over the years has had to uh, make his opinion on those two subjects known as he uh, continued to write about uh, new religions under the title cult. Now, this is a, remains a very, very important uh, use of the term cult in popular culture to describe those groups that deviate from Christianity uh, for several reasons. Uh, one, it, it gave a base to the early social scientists who began to study groups. They borrowed the term from Irvine and uh, did the early studies during the 20s, 30s, and 40s on cult groups, uh, trying to argue that they were try using the term cult to, as a neutral term, but failing in that um, possibility always. Uh, for them, the, the term cult was used to designate a group that was not serious religion. Uh, it was always an unspoken uh, uh, idea. Uh, the assumption underlying the treatment of the in sociology through the 1960s were that cults were a one generation, charismatic leader oriented groups believing in all sorts of exotic ideas, the unbelievable. And the first generation of NRM scholars, we spent a lot of time refuting each of these ideas about cults that we had been given by uh, the generation before us. In the 1970s, we saw a second definition of cult come around with the modern secular cult awareness movement. The founders of that movement quickly learned that the Christian definition of cult does not fly when you're getting the government to act against NRMs. So they went looking for a behavior-based definition, which was handed to them by several psychologists, notably Jocelyn West and Margaret Singer, uh, brainwashing. That is, cults brainwash recruits, take away their freedom through a mysterious and sinister form of mental manipulation. It appears to be an empirical theory but it had no basis in any current research on NRMs. None of its advocates have ever actually studied NRMs, though a few have formerly been members of one group or the other. It is a theory that relies on guilt by association. That is, group A has been called a cult. Therefore, it must brainwash people. And we can operate from that premise on to group B and group C, et cetera. Through the 1980s, cults were also accused of heading toward a Jonestown-like climax, though again, with no evidence to support the claim. At present, <clears throat> we are also confronted with another term, say a jow a term used in China over the last two centuries to describe various superstitious and heretical groups. <clears throat> it was reintroduced into the language in the early 1980s, but only became part of the popular discourse after being applied to Falun Gong as the new century began. The English term cult was adapted by the Chinese government as the official term by which to translate the Chinese term, say a jiao. To understand this new term, we must note that China has five officially recognized religions, each represented by a national organization. Those are the only religions that have legal status in the country. There's also a, a special and temporary category for independent Protestant Christianity. And then there are the say a jiao. These are groups we encounter outside of China and immediately consider as new religions. But in China, Seiya Zhao are not religion, not bad religion, not odd religion, not minority religion. They are not religion at all. They are defined as secular criminal organizations that operate under the facade of religion. Again, this is not a definition based on any empirical research. 
It is one of several legal definitions that can be applied to any group by the state on any, without any empirical research. Uh, any group offering the appearance of religion that operates outside of the five religions in China uh, is considered a say a Jiao. What it is or does, or its social status, or its country uh, counterculture presentation is irrelevant. Only its organizational independent status. Say a Jiao has little to do with contemporary Western concepts of cults as evil religion, as Say a Jiao are considered in China not religion at all, and. It's very obvious when one looks in, at Chinese law, for example, there are a set of laws that govern, say, a Jiao. There are a set of party regulations that govern religion, and the two are never discussed in the same documents. The term cult emerged through the late 20th century as a shorthand term by which people could express their dislike of different groups for their own particular reasons. Each individual anti-cultist could create their own list of cults, their own reason for disliking these particular groups and present it. The word cult lost all of its meaning. It became merely a label to place on groups you don't like. Most recently, of course, the, in the US, this term has enjoyed a uh, certain degree of uh, revival as it has been applied to the cult of Trump. And uh, so we are, are getting to use the term again. But I would suggest that uh, at least for those of us in the academic field, the term cult has certainly lost all of its meaning. And uh, whether or not uh, we have any use for it other than to uh, continually remind our colleagues in the press and our colleagues in other disciplines and our colleagues in the political field that this is a term that we should uh, uh, get rid of as we have other prejudicial terms. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Jordan. You were um, exemplary with your timing. So our second speaker is Rod Dubrow Marshall. Um, he's speaking in a personal capacity, um, but he has a long and distinguished history of helping um, interventions with people who have been harmed by religious groups, um, often groups that have been called cults or, or new religions. He's a co-editor of the International Journal of Coercion, Abuse and Manipulation, a member of the board of directors of the International Cultic Studies Association, and co-founder of the Reentry Therapy Information and Referral Network in the UK. And he's gonna be speaking this evening on the recognition of cults and interchangeable and overlapping terms in the age of undue influence, a focus on harm and survivors. Welcome, Ron. Thank you very much, uh, Suzanne. I'm really pleased to uh, be here and I hope that everyone can uh, see my uh, screen okay. Um, yeah, it's great. Slide presentation. So I want to start by saying that I think this is a really important and useful discussion and that we are living, um, in my view, in the age of undue influence and also coercive control as terms which are tremendously important for understanding the myriad of influences in our day to day lives. And it's for that reason, I believe, that the term cult has greater relevance and utility than probably ever before. Um, so I speak to you uh, unapologetically. Uh, somebody who is part of what I see as a long um, proud tradition of being anti-cult in the sense of being anti-groups that harm other people, uh, whether those groups are religious, political, psychotherapeutic or business. And I'll go on to explain how for me and for a number of the organisations I've done work with, that term uh, is still relevant, uh, as is that focus on harm and in working with survivors. So a widely accepted definition of cults is the one that I've got on the screen. I won't read that out um, this evening, um, but it is uh, the secular type of definition that Gordon referenced earlier, but one that focuses specifically on practices 
I'm not going to get uh, sidetracked into a discussion around brainwashing today because that's typically the kind of discussion that um, one gets tempted into because it then obscures the fact that there are groups um, in the world, some religious, some political, some of other types, that harm other people through their practices. And the whole brainwashing debate, I think, has been a distraction for the fact that harm happens and regardless of where it happens, people should be held to account for that harm. And harm happens because people are treated sometimes appallingly in some of the groups that are uh, referred to as cults. Now, cults are on a continuum, and I eschew an approach that generally says this group is a cult, this group is not a cult, as does uh, ICSA. Um, but actually, this definition, uh, which was partly developed by Louis John West and Michael Langoni back in 1986, I think has stood the test of time because it specifically uh, refers to unethically manipulative techniques of persuasion and control, which actually transcends uh, issues specifically of the psychological harm, because that's something that needs to be investigated separately and has been in many instances, including in examples of new religions. Um, but in particular, in terms of the definitional issue, where that's to advance the goals of the group's leaders, and importantly, to the detriment of members, their families, or the wider community. In that sense, then, I think this is a working definition that is very useful and allows us to cut through what I accept can be unhelpful uses of the term cult uh, in the media. And so I'm the first to actually sit when I speak with the media to say I will not simply categorise a group loosely and nor will I overuse the term. Um, but that does not mean to say that aspects of cultic practice and ethical manipulative practice should not be called out for what they are, and in particular, the harm that it causes to people should not be called out for what it is. I believe the term cult, therefore, in the age of under-influence, sits at the intersection between a lot of other overlapping terms, and it's useful for us to consider the overlapping nature of these phenomena. Some cults are terrorist groups, some are externally violent, uh, some are not. Some cults can also be referred to in terms of their modus operandi as gangs. Some, indeed, are new religious movements. Many are not. Many groups are not um, religious at all. Uh, and some can actually be described um, as oligarchies or dictatorships. And I won't go into each of these because of time. But my focus, very much, as per the definition, is on the deed, not the creed, is in looking at the aspects of coercive control and influence, looking at the extent to which that uh, coercive persuasion is taking place. And where that is causing harm, where that is causing problems to people's health and well-being, then all groups, all organisations should be held to account for that. And where those groups are being externally violent, then clearly they need to be held to account too. So in terms of what are cults, the reason why I think it's the case that there's a greater, wider understanding. And just because there's a wider understanding of something doesn't mean it's necessarily wrong. It's because throughout history, <clears throat> we've seen groups that operate unethically and that harm their members on occasions, who then externalize that harm, such as the case with Om Shinrikyo. In more recent times, we've seen that again in a terrorist cult in the case of ISIS Daesh. These are groups that are inherently harmful and I am very clear in saying that these are cults, these are harmful groups, and it's right that government take action against them. And there's been a long tradition of exploring the intersection between cults and terrorist organisations, uh, including way back to 2006 in terms of articles in a special edition of Cultic Studies Review, the predecessor journal to the one I edited prior to IGCAM. And then, uh, for example, in 2017, at a meeting between the Radicalisation Awareness Network, the EU, European Commission funded network and ICSA, where there was this understanding that continues about the overlap and intersection uh, between these different fields. It's also the case that there's a greater understanding than ever before about the way in which that coercive persuasion and unethically manipulative techniques are used to traffic and exploit people for the labor and on occasions in the form of sex trafficking. The Nexium case stands out, I think, as a landmark example of a group that enshrines all of those cultic practices to an extreme degree and actually allows us to see that overlap with trafficking gangs uh, for what it is. And there's been some excellent analysis, um, including in a new edition of IJCAM that's just been published regarding this matter. 
And it's also the case that cults are family-based, that coercive persuasion and abuse takes place in families or too many, and that this can sometimes also be ideological, as in the case of the Balakrishnan cult in South London, uh, the BBC made the Cult Next Door documentary. So I think the, cult, the term cult has wide utility, as well as being something then that historically has been shown to cause harm to some people. And we should not shy away from that. And of course, in the nature of human science, and I'm a psychologist, it's always very difficult empirically to be precise about it. But that doesn't mean to say that I think we should then ignore the harm for what it is. And it's noteworthy uh, that in DSM-5, there has been for many years now a definition of identity disturbance, the changes uh, that people go through when they're subjected to intensive coercive persuasion, including uh, the aforementioned brainwashing, uh, but also terms like thought reform. But notice that the term cult in that sense is recognised for being one of the types of organisation that can cause this change uh, to somebody's psychology psychologically over a period of time. Research, including my own, has identified the way in which an unhealthy dominance of one particular group to the exclusion of others in terms of the person's psychology can have detrimental consequences to the person and can be allied to and causative of uh, trauma coerced attachment and also complex PTSD. And this has been illustrated across domains, whether it's coercive persuasion in groups, cults, extremist groups, in trafficking, or indeed in intimate partner violence. And to that extent, uh, cult, I think, is a useful way to categorize the group-based elements of this, while we should also use terms like coercive control to examine the phenomenon more broadly across those different domains of which I speak. It's important, therefore, to recognize the following that some groups under some circumstances harm some people. When we use the term cult, in other words, we're not actually doing what Gordon Melton alleges, which is to say that all the groups are the same as each other, far from it. We're saying that uh, cultic influence, coercive persuasion is on a continuum. And that where people allege that they've been harmed by that, that deserves examination, that deserves to be taken seriously. And that, yes, judgment should rest on careful analyses of structure and behaviour within a specific context. And I also eschew superficial classification. But that does not mean that where harm is clear and evident, that we should shy away from calling it out. I take a fundamental approach towards a survivor perspective on these matters. The term which works best for recovery and rehabilitation from abuse is the term that should be used. I know of former members of cults that like using the term cult. It explains the cultic influence, the coercive persuasion that they've experienced. I know others who prefer not to use that term. I don't sit as a psychologist, whether in academia or practice, and pass judgment on the terms that people should use. I respect phenomenologically, but also human being to human being, the fact that a term might be more or less useful to one person compared to another. In that sense, I've just listed here some of the overlapping terms again that can be used to describe this phenomenon. But the fact that cult might not be the term of choice for all does not mean to say that the cult term should be dismissed altogether. I believe it is a unifying concept that describes an ethically manipulative coercion in group contexts, one that explains the way in which that affects people psychologically and links to the forms of psychological harm that I've just detailed. In that regard, I believe the term cult is popular because it says something to people who've been harmed. It says something to people who've been unethically manipulated. And religion, politics and business should never be a shield against people being held to account for when they harm somebody else. I sit here, I speak as somebody who defends freedom of speech, freedom of religion, very seriously. But I also defend people's right not to be abused and not to be harmed by coercive control and persuasion. And that, for me, is where the definition of a cult and the use of the term is useful in calling out those occasions where influence tips from being benign into undue. And here in this age under influence with the Internet and the myriad of influences across the world, there's never been a greater time and a greater need 
for us to understand cultic influence and to use the term as a way that recognizes harm, helps people recover, and importantly also seeks to prevent that kind of practice from occurring in the future. I truly believe that if governments took action against these cases of abuse, cases of cultic practice, and if organizations, whether religious or political, open themselves up to that scrutiny, we would have a more sensible and progressive discussion than whiling away the hours academically, debating whether one particular term is better than another. I enjoy these debates, but what I enjoy more is helping people to recover and preventing others from succumbing to cultic influence. Thank you very much, Rod, for a fantastic presentation. Um, our third speaker this evening is Mujan Momen, who's an independent scholar, and he's going to be speaking to us about sect, cult, or world religion, the positioning of the Baha'i faith. Thank you, Mujan. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to bring my PowerPoint up. Okay. Um, yes, so this is a presentation on, on what uh, designation to use about the Baha'i faith. Um, sect, cult, or world religion, and I'm going to suggest some other ones as well. Um, first question to ask is, when we're doing this sort of classification, are we doing it to increase understanding by um, uh, looking at a, a religious group and classifying it in order to compare it with other religious groups and, and increase our understanding, or are we pigeonholing in order to impose an understanding uh, and think that we now can explain everything about that religion and we don't need to think any more about it and we just forget a few inconvenient facts that don't quite fit in with the way that we've classified it. Um, in the whole of this discussion, we have to be clear about whether we're talking about the academic use of these terms or the sort of vernacular use of these terms. And lastly, of course, with the word cult, we have to be clear as to whether we're using it in a sort of pre or post 1970s way. And uh, of course, all narratives, including academic ones, are socially constructed, culturally conditioned, and politically negotiated, as I hope my presentation will be a, an example of. So with regard to the word sect, uh, I'm going to skip through this bit fairly quickly because it wasn't part of the conference blurb, um, and my presentation's a bit too long already. Um, if we, up to the 1960s, it was common to find Baha'i in Islam chapters of a book uh, on religions classed as a modern Islamic reform movement. And uh, if we look at the Oxford English definition of the word, uh, Oxford English dictionary definition of the word sect, um, th this is what is being implied by using the word sect, that the Baha'i faith is a sect of Islam. And Baha'is generally reject this depiction, insisting that the Baha'i faith is an independent religion. And I've given there a quote from the website of the Ottawa Baha'i community saying that um, this is a common and enduring misconception about the Baha'i faith, that it's an offshoot of Islam. And better understanding is the analogy that the Baha'i faith is to Islam, what Christianity is to Judaism. The Baha'i faith is rooted in Islam, but is a fully independent religion. Um, also, it should be noted that uh, this idea that the Baha'i faith is a sect of Islam is rejected by Muslims as well. As early as 1925, a Sharia court in Egypt rejected this notion, um, and in uh, as recent and, and more recently in 1981, Pakistan recognised the Baha'i faith as a non-Muslim religious minority, uh, and there are other examples as well. But of course, uh, there is also the um, sociology of religion use of the word tech, uh, sect in, in the sort of sect denomination church um, spectrum. I uh, haven't got time to go in detail through this chart, but basically I've put down the features of each of these as, as uh, um, uh, described by various authors. And then on the right-hand column, I've put uh, the Baha'i faith. And the conclusion from this is that the Baha'i faith doesn't actually fit any of these three uh, very well. Going on to the word cult, uh, of course, we have the pre-1970s various definitions. I've just picked one from uh, Roden Richardson from 1978. Uh, he 
Um, and the Baha'i faith doesn't fit this description. It's not a small religious group. It's this five to seven million Baha'is. It isn't lacking organizational structure. It has a very well-defined organizational structure. It doesn't at present have a charismatic leader, although it did historically. It, it has its mystical aspect, but uh, the, the Baha'i uh, uh, teachings are quite clear that this spiritual or mystical aspect has to be reflected in ethical conduct. And in turn, that has to be reflected in social action. Uh, the only part of the definition that you could say does fit the Baha'i faith is that it does derive its inspiration and ideology from outside the predominant religious culture. Um, also should be noted that the, with the evangelical countercult movement in the 1960s and 70s, um, Baha'is were a target of, of that. Um, this book, Walter Martin's The Kingdom of the Cults, was sort of like the textbook for evangelical Christian anti-cult um, uh, people who were engaged in anti-cult activity, and the Baha'i faith is one of the chapters in that book. Going on to the post-1970s and the press hysteria over cults and accusations of brainwashing and financial and sexual scandals, the general idea that cults are dangerous. By and large, if we take the secular anti-cult organizations, Baha'is were not listed um, in, by and large, it's not totally true, but by and large, they weren't listed and they weren't considered a group of concern. However, what happened with the evangelical counter-cult groups in that time was that they became increasingly linked, politicized, and linked to far-right political groups who have their own conspiracy theories about global governance and new world order. And the um, attack on the Baha'i uh, from these groups became increasingly uh, directed against uh, teachings of the Baha'i faith about global governance. And of course, uh, when we talk about it being 1960s, 70s and 80s, we should recognize that it continues to the present day, particularly in Europe, in countries of Eastern Europe and Russia. You have legis anti-cult legislation and anti-cult rhetoric in, in, at the political level. And even in countries like France and Germany and Belgium, you have uh, anti-cult rhetoric. And lastly, just to note that um, uh, the Islamic uh, anti-Baha'i rhetoric, particularly that coming from Iran, is increasingly framing the Baha'is as a cult in line with the 1970s and 80s vernacular use of that word. Uh, just a quick word about new religious movements. Um, this is used a lot by in, stu in the study of religion as a sort of substitute for the word cult, which has become a bit pejorative. Um, it's defined, uh, there's various definitions. This one from Peter Clark uh, says that they are innovative religious and spiritual movements that have emerged since the end of World War II. Well, uh, that doesn't apply to the Baha'i faith, which has been around for 160 years and came to North America and Europe in the 1890s. And it would be rejected by Baha'is because the word movement suggests a transitory nature, something that's going to either become a fully fledged religion or die away. And again, Baha'is would reject that and also reject the implication of a lack of organization and structure that the word movement might imply. Um, the word new religion is used by um, Peter Clark in his article, in his article on new religious movements in the Encyclopedia of New Religious Movements. He actually uses the word new religion throughout that article, and his centre at King's College was called the Centre for New Religions. Uh, it's much less frequently used in academic works, apart from those of Peter Clark himself, but probably Baha'is would not object to the use of the word as being a, an objective description. The word minority religion has been increasingly used by some scholars, particularly those dealing with minority rights and, and, and legal issues. Um, again, Baha'is probably would not object to that usage. Uh, I myself am a little bit suspicious about this discourse because I, I question whether discourse on minorities is being used by the social elite to um, maintain themselves in power, to strengthen their grip on power by increasing and deepening divisions in society and thus strengthening the narrative that they represent the majority, whereas of course they only represent themselves. Um, and uh, I also wonder whether a discourse that involved giving, giving rights to minorities uh, is useful uh, because um, 
if it's if rights are given by legislation they can also be taken away by legislation and i would suggest it's much more useful to talk about inalienable human rights given to all human beings because they are human beings and that tends to then see uh, society as a co cohesive whole rather than rights being given to minorities uh, by a legislative process which tends towards emphasizing division and difference in society with regard to the term world religion, this has been problematized by many scholars as essentializing a neo-colonialist, and I have no objection to the arguments that scholars use along those lines, but I would just ask the question, um, th this term has now been adopted by people of religion, they see themselves under this, under these world religion categories, and you have organisations um, uh, such as the Muslim Council of Britain and the Hindu Council of UK, based on the world religions paradigm. So, when academics start problematising this term, is it a repeat process of academic neo-colonialism trying to tell people of religion how they should think about their own religion? Um, the, uh, However, this world religion paradigm is quite well embedded. It's a major conceptual framework for, and many scholars use it. In particular, for example, the, the religious statistician wouldn't, statisticians wouldn't have a job if it weren't for the world religions paradigm. They produce lists of religions such as this one from the World Christian Database. And you can see the Baha'is there third on this alphabetical list, separate from Muslims and new religionists. And this is another one from World Religion Project, and again, you can see Baha'is here, not as a subsection of Islam. So by and large, Baha'is are very happy with this type of framework. Um, they, they would enthusiastically embrace, them, uh, embrace a description of themselves as a world religion. Basically, th this is just the summary slide of the whole presentation. The word sect, the Baha'is Baha don't fit either the sociological or the vernacular use of this word, and Baha'is themselves reject it. The word cult, Baha'i, uh, the same applies to the word cult and Baha'is reject it. New religious movement doesn't fit the Baha'i faith, at least under some definitions, although I accept that there are some def definitions that would fit the Baha'i faith, but Baha'is would probably reject it. I mean, I can't speak for Baha'is. I haven't done a survey, but I would say they would probably reject it. A uh, new religion or minority religion, Baha'is would probably accept it even. Uh, yes, they would probably accept that. And the world religion um, uh, as a designation for the Baha'i faith, although many academics problematize it, uh, I think Baha'is would accept that. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. That was a, a nice tour of the different ways a particular very large religious group interacts with the terms that have been in, in discourse and, and how they're, they're, they have quite different contexts um, and different political implications um, depending on the situation. Our next speaker this evening is going to be Philip Dislip. He's a PhD candidate at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and a historian of American religions. His research has largely focused on Asian metaphysical and marginal religions in modern America. Um, he's published on Sikhism, New Thought, and the development of early American yoga, amongst many other things. He's also done a lot of work in popular culture publications and um, has a very interesting photographical eye. Um, he's speaking tonight on the uses and applications of the word cult in American newspapers in the 1990s. So bringing the discussion a bit more um, to the 21st century. Philip. Hi. Um... Okay, can, can you see my... Can you see my PowerPoint? Yep. Okay, perfect. Um, good morning and good evening. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm gonna speak with you today on the uses and applications of the word cult in American newspapers in the 1990s. Uh, so to begin, here is a portrait of me uh, during my Catholic boyhood. Um, one of the things that I remember most about uh, growing up as a Catholic was constantly asking annoying questions of everything that I was told that we needed to do. Why do my feet have to be flat, flat, uh, flat on the floor? Uh, why do we have to do this? Why do we have to do that? Um, I was reminded of myself as a pesky child uh, when I was doing my reading for my comprehensive exam on new religious movement. Um, I kept coming across in articles and monographs and edited volumes um, 
the sentiment that I think Jay Gordon Melton um, perfectly repeated uh, here today, um, that we do not use the word cult. Uh, there is no use for it. The term cult has no meaning. It is simply a pejorative term that we use, quote, for any group that we do not like. Um, and I was always kind of bothered by that. And I was always bothered by the insistence that um, we needed to use an ever evolving um, substitute for the term cult, even though uh, when academic researchers um, referred to new religious movements, they were very often referring to the same set of groups that public would refer to as cult. So what I decided to do um, was to embark on a large data-driven research project um, to answer three basic questions. Number one, what religious groups are described explicitly as cults uh, in popular discourse? Uh, second, how is the term cult used? And third, are the semantically empty and pejorative ideas of the term cult valid? Uh, so to do that, um, I decided to look at uses of the term cult and other terms in newspapers uh, throughout the 1990s. So why newspapers and why the 1990s? I think most of us here would know why the 1990s. Um, it is a very important decade um, for new religious movements, for uh, the public's understanding of cults. Um, we have the events in Waco with the Branch Davidians in 93. We have uh, the events uh, with Ohm in 95, uh, Heaven's Gate in 97, um, the Solar Temple throughout uh, the decade, and finally at the very end of the decade, you have the fears of uh, the ensuing millennia and also the movement for the restoration of the Ten Commandments of God. Uh, I feel that newspapers are a good resource, uh, not only because of online archives and digitization projects that make a huge amount of data accessible to anyone with an internet connection, but also um, the 1990s is um, very much pre-internet. Uh, it is the rise of the 24 hour television news cycle. And it is also the decade before the, um, um, the unsettling drop off in newspaper circulation. So I feel like while it's not absolute or complete, um, by looking at newspapers during the 1990s, um, we can get a very strong sense of what the public discourse around the term cult and groups that are labeled as cults was like. Uh, and it's just a bit of explanation. Um, this project began uh, with an undergraduate class in new religious movements that I taught in 2019, um, and I've been continuing it uh, recently. So um, the conclusions are kind of a combination of this earlier work and current work, uh, but all the graphs that you're going to see are from um, the earlier research uh, from several years ago. So what did I do? Um, I did two main things. I did a quantitative analysis um, looking at the number of mentions of the word cult in several key terms uh, throughout um, in the recent uh, bit of research from 14 newspapers. Uh, weighted by circulation figures. So we're looking at approximately 49 billion potential newspaper reads throughout the decade from 14 newspapers, and then a content analysis, which I think will ultimately reach approximately 20,000 uses of the word cult from 15 newspapers in the United States throughout the decade. And these newspapers are diverse in terms of um, their location throughout the country, their size and their circulation. Um, so we began uh, looking at the term cult and cults in 29 newspapers uh, in the decade. And you see these big bumps. And I think we kind of assume uh, what these bumps are. 93, it's the Branch Davidians. 95, it's Ohm. 97, it's Heaven's Gate. 99, it's the Millennium. And then we plugged in a series of key terms. Uh, you see them here on the left. Uh, cult, cults, Gresh, Ohm, Solar Temple, Heaven's Gate, Movement for the Restoration of the Ten Commandments of God, Jonestown, and then it's kind of controls uh, Scientology, Unification Church, and Hare Krishna. Uh, and what we found in uh, the frequency of mention of these groups throughout the 1990s was that in some senses, it matched what we expected with those rise, with the rise and fall of the term cult and cult. Um, we would see what we, what we would expect. But I think when we look at the frequency of mention of these groups, 
I think one of the, the major conclusions is that even though in academic literature, we talk about these groups, uh, we kind of group them together uh, in the decade, the amount of press attention that is focused on the Solar Temple and the movements for the restoration of the Ten Commandments of God is, is almost negligible. Um, the coverage that's given to Ohm and Heaven's Gate is significant. And interestingly, it is at about the same level as the general mentions of cults in the lead up to the millennium. I think the real story is the amount of attention that the Branch Davidians get. It is difficult to overstate how large it is. And the amount of press attention given to the Branch Davidians throughout the decade um, is larger than the mention of Om, Heaven's Gate, Solar Temple, and the Movement for the Restoration of the Ten Commandments of God all combined. I'm happy to talk about that uh, in the question and answer uh, session. Um, one of the conclusions is that the term cult um, was explicitly given to groups, to a very small number of groups. Um, I think this is one of the most striking examples. In 93, 95, and 97, the word cult is used to describe religious groups to these through group, three groups 85% of the time. They take up that much of a bulk of the use of the term cult. Uh, and then we did our content analysis. Um, and in scanning newspapers, uh, it seemed that six major categories were used for the term cult. Uh, there was cult following, cult heroes, um, the following of products like the cult of Harley Davidson. Um, second were cult films and television. These are usually television series and movies that have a small but dedicated audience. Um, it also tends to designate not just offbeat or weird, but also television programs and films that seem to exist beyond the typical life and death cycle of network television in Hollywood. Third was the label of cult. Um, this is describing something explicitly as cult-like. Uh, you see this in newspapers talking about the cult of multiculturalism, the cult-like belief in victimhood. Uh, fourth is the cult of personality, um, usually used with political figures, uh, either candidates or autocratic rulers. Fifth is uh, religious cults. And for this category, we use um, groups that exist in reality, also generic uh, references to cults and also fictionalized religious cults. And last uh, category was cults of antiquity and devotion. Uh, so this would be uh, the cult of Shiva worship in India, uh, Dionysian cults, uh, the Catholic cult of the saints. And so as we were breaking down uh, uses of the term cult into these six categories, this is what we found uh, throughout the decade. Um, we see the rise and fall with new religious movements, and then we see um, these other uses. Uh, I think one of the big conclusions uh, that we found, that was by count, this is by percentage, is that when you combine together all the other uses, uh, when the word cult is being used in newspapers in the 1990s, more often than not, it's not referring to um, religious groups. It's referring to something else, sports hero, a product, um, a metaphor, a television program. Uh, what we then did is we then combined what I would describe as positive uses of the term cult and negative uses of the term cult. When we say that something has a cult following, uh, we say that something, a cult music group, a cult television program, that's overwhelmingly positive. There are also the negative uses. Someone having a cult of personality or someone being described as cult-like is negative. Uh, I wear the, I'm aware that we're at 10 minutes. Uh, if I can just have a few minutes more and wrap up. Uh, there's only a few more slides. Uh, what we found is that throughout the 90s, there was what we would describe as semantic drift. Uh, it seems like the events of the 1990s uh, shifted the way that the American public thought of the term cult. Uh, we see this with the percentage of usage, uh, which is striking. Uh, the use of cult for religious groups kind of seems to go back to normal after this really dramatic movement throughout the decade. But positive uses plummet from over 50% uh, to less than 40%, and negative uses rise from about 20% to 30%. So to go back to um, Ed's point in the introduction, it seems that popular rhetoric does in fact shape the public's perception and the reality of cult. Um, so some brief conclusions uh, to wrap up. Preliminary conclusions from this research would suggest that very few religious groups are explicitly labeled as cults. 
those that tend to be labeled as cults are what I would call an exaggerated aggregate of qualities that we associate with new religious movements. If NRMs are new and novel, if they're on the margins of society, they're often in conflict with society and enmeshed in controversy, the groups that directly get called cults are ones that are exaggerated combinations of all these elements. They're very new, they're very much marginal, and they're very much uh, enmeshed in uh, controversy. For many of the other groups that we tend to associate with NRMs, the cult label is at most implied. We see newspapers often referring to groups as, quote, being thought of as a cult or, quote, being accused of being a cult. Um, and I would say there are two reasons for this. It seems like the public is so familiar with certain groups that just the term Scientologist, Mooney, or Hare Krishna is enough to work the same as cult member. And there are often the efforts of these groups themselves to push back against being called cults. Um, the term cult more often than not does not refer to NRM. Um, and there are multiple nuanced uses of the term cult that can be positive, negative, or both. Uh, often we see celebrities and sports figures being described as ascending to or finally reaching cult status. The public ideas about cults and religious cults can perhaps be understood through their many other uses of the term. Um, and you know, I would point to, to what Rod said um, uh, just a few moments ago. I think the three ways that we can look at this are through combinations, comparisons, and counterexamples. How the term cult is being combined with other things. Um, as Rod mentioned, when people talk about cults with gangs, uh, drugs, uh, with terrorist groups. Uh, the second is with comparisons. Uh, when we pay attention to what people mean when they say something is cult-like, what are they implying about cults themselves? And lastly, uh, counterexamples. When people say, we are not a cult, we are this, what are they describing cults as through that rejection of the term? These public ideas of what a cult is or what makes a religious group a cult seem to encompass most academic and popular theories of NRMs. So we have this cluster of definitions, sociologists talking about um, formation and organization of groups and charismatic leaders, uh, psycholo psychological interpretations of manipulation uh, and belief, uh, religious studies believing that uh, NRMs are new, um, their intention with the popular uh, culture, and the religious and secular anti-cult movement, their ideas of being anti-Christian, unorthodox, or fraudulent, or manipulative. Public ideas of what a cult is seem to encompass all of these ideas. So then, uh, in conclusion, I would say that cult would then not seem to be a simple pejorative term or a term that is semantically empty, but one that is actually full of complex, shifting, and overlapping meanings and connotations. Um, and a term that I think, both historically and in the present moment, is certainly worthy of our continued attention and study. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Philip, for that very interesting empirical journey through the 90s. Um, our final formal speaker before we have our respondent is Erin Prophet. She's the a visiting assistant professor, sorry, a visiting assistant professor at the University of Florida in the Department of Religion. And she's got a very diverse research base. Um, her research has focused on um, the relationships between religion and medicine, um, Western esotericism. Um, she's published on cancer survival and charisma and theosophy and Scientology. Um, and she's also the daughter of Elizabeth Clare Prophet, who, and she grew up within the Summit Lighthouse Church Universal and Triumphant movement, which her mother led um, and came under the label of cult in various contexts. So uh, tonight she's going to be speaking to us on rhetoric and stigma, lessons from the cult wars. All right. Well, thank you, Suzanne. And quite an interesting conversation to be jumping into. So I've taught now uh, for the past three years a course called Cults and New Religious Movements. I did not name the course. It was actually established uh, before I arrived here. Uh, but I, the students who take the course obviously are selecting for something that they find of, of great interest. It's a popular course. Um, the two most popular groups for paper topics are Heaven's Gate and Scientology, probably partly because the headquarters of Scientology is here in Florida. 
Um, so generally it takes the entire course before the students come to realize that it's very, very difficult to, to define cult. <laughs> and um, in teaching the course, I'm able to bring in some of my own experience um, growing up in a group that was perceived as a cult by many. It's not one of the sort of uh, top of the radar groups, but we did have a millennialist incident that uh, brought us to worldwide attention at one point. Uh, but my early years were shaped by this, um, certainly this boundary setting by Christian groups who felt that we were a threat because we combined Eastern and Western ideas. And I can remember vividly a uh, Christian group. We were, we were at that time in California renting a, a property in, in Pasadena uh, that had been a university campus. And there were Christian groups who felt that we should not be there because we were of the devil. And they had um, picket signs up and they were marching around. They actually marched around our campus seven times. Uh, they reprised the march around Jericho uh, as a way of sort of getting us to leave, which eventually happened, but not because of their work. So they were holding these signs up that said, you know, think for yourselves, um, some of them. And so, you know, I eventually left the group on my own. I consider I had a pretty good childhood. I had some concerns and issues with the group and the way it was run, uh, especially during my uh, 20s when I, after I finished college. But when I encountered these ideas, and especially through the work of Margaret Singer and Louis Julian West and others that we somehow uh, you know, couldn't be trusted, we'd been coached, we didn't know our own minds, we couldn't speak for ourselves, even though we actually thought that we were smarter than the Christians who were attacking us. Uh, we thought that we had some special access to truth. You know, for me, my journey out of the group involved, you know, in somewhat reading about historical study of religions, understanding more about the roots of our faith. I don't believe that my parents deliberately concealed these facts, but there certainly were elements that had I known them, I might have been more skeptical, um, you know, which leads me to feel that I'm somewhere in the middle, caught in the middle. Um, you know, I believe that the cult rhetoric of the 70s, 70s and 80s probably made things worse uh, in the terms of the polarization of society against our group. It made it worse for people who were school children, had, trying to participate in sports, uh, trying to, um, you know, we were not uh, controlled as far as where we could uh, go. We had some cultural filters around us, just like, you know, many Christian groups, you know, won't read Harry Potter or something like that. So, um, when I left, as I said, um, I eventually decided to get a master's in public health. And I became obviously drawn to some of the work, the body of work that's been done about religion and medicine. And I came to understand uh, religion as a social determinant of health. And looking at therapeutic approaches to members or former members of new religious movements, I felt that there was a big gap between what therapists may know or think they know about cults of minority faiths and the lived experience of people who've been in them. And there's, there was certainly a great lack of attention to the notion that people could be individuals, that they may make individual choices, that they may be in the borderline between being in and out of a group, that they may have friends and family in the group, that they may, in a sense, be an individual, a multi-layered individual with many identities, just as a Catholic or a member of a so-called world religion or um, majority or dominant faith would be. And so, um, I am concerned that there seem to be um, too many deficit-based perspectives. Um, the uh, idea from the DSM-5 that Rod brought up, that you know, the definition, the notion that there's some kind of a carve out for members of cultist groups, which are, you know, not nowhere defined. Uh, that they should somehow get separate or special treatment in mental health care, as opposed to members of dominant faith, I find actually to be a violation of human rights. I find it to be 
insulting to members of these groups. And I think that there needs to be simply be treat them as you would a member of any other faith. Uh, we know that religion can enhance a person's health and well-being. We also know that religion can contribute to what's called spiritual struggle and problems and difficulties. And that at different points in people's lives, people may, uh, may or may not feel this sense of spiritual struggle. Uh, we also know that religions and religious beliefs can exacerbate symptoms. So some of the ideas that I have about what could be done to reduce some of the tensions between minority faiths and society would include things like more, um, more recognition of the importance of religion education. Um, in the United States, American Academy of Religion has a set of um, standards for the way that um, students, all students, K through 12 should be educated. I don't believe that anyone should have to get to college and take it, uh, you know, ha just happen to take a course on new religious movements or on historical critical approaches to the Bible or anything else in order to understand some of these, you know, approaches that have been developed by scholars over the past 150 years. Um, I think that, uh, you know, the American Counseling Association espouses a set of values for ethical approaches to um, religious values in counseling. And it's my belief that these should be sort of more widely applied and more uh, widely appreciated. Uh, one of these values suggests that if a person or therapist or even a friend, family member, whatever is trying to work with or interact with a person who's been, is currently, or was a member of minority faith, that they should try to understand their worldview, that they should understand the, the level at which their um, religious beliefs inform their activities, to try to understand what kinds of spiritual struggle they may be going through, and should also seek out experts. And that's why I think it's wonderful that Inform maintains its databases, and it's in, uh, information. And I think that these types of efforts should be expanded as a way of helping to reduce the kinds of tensions that can arise. Uh, we know that some of these violent incidents that have been referred to by some of our speakers were precipitated by um, conflict over the treatment of children, for example. Um, so just switching back briefly to my own story, um, our group, had been in California, in Los Angeles, we eventually moved to Montana where we suddenly took on a much greater visibility, um, both internationally and in the local community, we were very easy to spot and pick out. And so I am currently working actually with Susan Palmer on a project on children in new religious movements. And one of the things that we found in our research is that yes, it's true, some uh, children do adopt and hold on to the concept of wanting to say that they were in a cult, uh, that it seems to help coalesce their post-group identity. And at the same time, others feel that it's a stigma and that they were persecuted and, you know, singled out at the swimming pool, for instance, as possible cult members. So um, I don't have any uh, final answer to the question of what, you know, whether we should use a term like cult, uh, whether, you know, whether this language policing um, is going to be successful. Obviously, we've, we have seen, you know, as Philip pointed out, this transition um, towards using, applying the term more broadly to not only the sports figures, but of course, the political movements. And um, you know, I just want to push back a little bit on this idea that, you know, just such manipulative techniques are somehow known and used by all cult leaders. And perhaps, you know, there's this notion that maybe there's a special school that all the cult leaders go to in order to uh, learn how to manipulate people. But I mean, I think if you broadly look at all the categories of cult that have been discussed here today, I think it's just sort of laughable that one could imagine that all of the leaders are 
right, working from the same playbook, unless it happens to be the playbook of human nature, the playbook of using technology as it's available. Um, we know also today in the United States that more and more people are leaving the so-called majority faith. And many of these new religious movements are part of the churn. They're part of this um, transformation of religion that has ha been happening within modernity. So I think it's also important to engage the members and even the leaders if they are willing and interested in um, promoting more ethical behavior. I don't think it would be, you know, completely out of the question to suggest that perhaps there should be some kind of, you know, gold standard of how to treat uh, current members, you know, in the sense of not asking them to give more money than they can afford. You know, um, I think that um, it's important to simply avoid labels and also to avoid category errors. And, you know, it's too bad that there isn't more funding available for studies on conversion and deconversion from uh, minority faiths and all faiths, because we know there have been great advances in the field of deconversion from majority faiths, right? And unfortunately, it seems to often be difficult to get a sample where you have pre and post um, individuals from minority faiths because there are fewer of them to study. And so you're often left with analyzing or evaluating people who have left. And so um, I am working currently on a project to try to develop better therapeutic approaches. I would say that the work of ICSA and people in the, the so-called cultic studies movement, um, well, well-intentioned, as I said, often ignores the individuality of the people in these groups. And I think it's just terribly important to make sure that their rights are affirmed and that they are treated as people. I'm the same person that I was when I was growing up in the group. I have, my outlook has changed. My social life has changed. I have transformed my values, but I still maintain friendships. And I would be quite sad if I had to determine that everything about the group I was in was somehow uh, done for the purpose of manipulation or aggrandizement of the leadership or something like that, as opposed to uh, something that groups of people got, got together, often with the intent of transforming or remapping existing spiritualities. And yes, they ran into difficulties. And yes, they struggle with some of the same difficult texts that are that are also causing problems in majority traditions. Some of the texts, that especially that involve gender, sexuality, et cetera. So I think it's important to be inclusive and to be open and forward-looking. I don't have a solution to the problem of uh, stereotypes uh, of cult members, because I think that, you know, especially if you watch all of the documentaries that have come out and even especially during COVID, it was just so, uh, it's almost, almost um, people were fascinated by each other, wild, wild country and the Rajneesh. And, you know, you see, you do see some change in tone and that some of the individual people in the groups are treated as individuals, but there's still this sense that, oh, they were, um, they didn't know themselves, right? They were manipulated, controlled, and somehow in bondage. And I so think- I'm gonna that, have to ask you to wrap up, Erin. Right. <laughs> sure, yeah. All right, so um, I look forward, I, it's wonderful to see so many uh, eminent scholars on this panel and in this meeting, and I look forward to working together um, to try to hopefully move this conversation in new directions. Thank you. Great, there's some great points there. So our final um, speaker is responding to all the previous speakers, um, and that's the esteemed Catherine Wessinger, who's the Reverend James Yamuchi Professor of History of Religions at Loyola University in New Orleans. Um, her primary research and teaching areas are women in religions, new religious movements, um, as well as Tibetan and Indian religions. She's had numerous 
edited um, journal articles, edited books, um, and I've mostly heavily relied on her work about religion and violence and millenarianism myself, but her most recent book is A Theory of Women in Religions, which um, I look forward to reading. Okay. Uh, so look forward to having your thoughts, and then we'll open it out to general questions. Okay. Thank you very much for that introduction, and it's an honor to be here. And uh, I've prepared some remarks, and I'll read through those, but I will also address these presentations. And I'll just mention that I specifically want to address Rod's presentation toward the end. So um, the meaning of any word can change over time. Pejorative connotations can be attributed to any word or term. We know that the word cult in its original meaning refers to worship in the sense of an organized system of worship, of an object of worship. However, the negative meaning attributed to the word cult has become so predominant in society that in Merriam-Webster, the first definition given is, quote, a religion regarded as unorthodox or spurious, end quote. Religion scholar Gordon Melton and historian Philip Jenkins have described the origins of the pejorative connotation attributed to the word cult in the 20th century, and we heard from Gordon earlier. And I'll just say that I heard Gordon make a presentation many years ago when I was just moving into this field of study, and he did successfully persuade me that the word cult is pejorative and scholars should not be using it. Jenkins writes in Mystics and Messiahs that the word cult has acquired its negative connotation in the United States around 1900. Um, and as he says, quote, under the influence of malignant stereotypes about non-Western religions that had been encountered during imperial adventures, end quote, facilitated by travel by steamship, railroad, and later air travel. By the mid 20th century, the word cult was being pejoratively applied, particularly to African-American new religious movements. So from the beginning of the pejorative meaning attributed to the word cult, in addition to the connotation of heresy that Gordon spoke about, there has been a strong racist motivation to label certain religions as other and dangerous. New religion scholars such as Eileen Barker, Gordon Melton, James T. Richardson, Thomas Robbins and others have pointed out that the word cult has been used to deny that certain movements are religions. Cult has been the term used by people who wish to reserve the category religion for ones that are socially constructed as being good and acceptable, even though there may be and there are widespread abuses committed in mainstream religious institutions. I was looking at the website for uh, ICSA, International Cultic Studies Association. And so for Buddhism and the Catholic Church, they have um, the statement of aberrations. You know, are there aberrations of, of uh, groups within the Catholic Church? Or are uh, Buddhist teachers who abuse followers, those are aberrations. But uh, I think uh, human beings are human beings, and you can't, abuses occur within uh larger and established religions, religious traditions, as well as in the smaller groups and movements. So applying the term cult to religions that are comparatively small, alternative in beliefs and practices, and marginal in relation to the dominant religions in society, incorrectly conveys the impression that abuse and, co and coercion occur only in the smaller socially despised religions. The pejorative meaning attributed to the cult label also serves other purposes. Former members who claim they were in a cult can utilize that as an excuse to absolve themselves of blame for poor judgment for participating in a despised group. When there is suspicion that a religious group's members are engaged in illegal activities, the cult label provides a ready-made answer and frequently inhibits responsible investigation. Worst of all, application of the cult label promotes fear in the general public and dehumanizes members of a group. So the wider society may approve of excessive actions taken against members, which harms innocence instead of protecting them. And I was uh, glad for Philip's presentation on the news coverage in the 90s because uh, in my research on the Branch Davidians, I, I think you can see that very strongly 
And, and so the FBI agents um, promoted the understanding of the Branch Davidians as a cult and then went ahead and took unnecessarily aggressive actions against them. The classic experiment by psychologist Albert Bandura demonstrated that participants were more willing to harm human subjects by administrating, ad administering electric shocks when those subjects were dehumanized by a label. New religious scholarship has shown that the word cult has performed a similar dehumanizing function. Therefore, it seems to me that mental health professionals would want to avoid utilizing a term that dehumanizes people. The terms cult-like and cultish also have the effect of dehumanizing members of a group that people in the wider society do not like by perpetuating what Richardson has termed the myth of the omnipotent leader and the myth of the passive brainwash follower. It is very dangerous when a government uses a pejorative term to label a group large or small. And so members of the Baha'i faith know this, uh, other religious members of other religious groups and movements, they know this. The work of sociologists Massimo Intervenia and Bitter Winter is demonstrating that the Chinese Communist Party and the People's Republic of China uses the term Zhijiao to stigmatize a religious movement that party leaders perceive to be too attractive to citizens. Zhijiao literally means heterodox teaching, but under the influence of the American anti-cult movement, it has been translated as evil cult. There are other ways that a religious group or movement may be studied without starting with the application of a pejorative label that inhibits careful investigation. And we've heard presentations here that um, illustrate, you know, uh, more open-minded uh, ways to, um, to investigate religious movements, religious groups, and including the harm that they've done. One way that I've approached it is to uh, study, I, I was um, motivated by the question, what is the connection between millennialism and violence? Because whenever you have some sort of dramatic episode of violence, not necessarily initiated by the members, um, it seems like millennial beliefs are inevitably um, present and, but I always remember what Gordon always said to me and, and also publicly that millennial movements are not necessarily violent. The majority are not. Okay. But nevertheless, that I, I've, you know, one of my topics has been to study the relationship between uh, millennial movements and, um, you know, periodic episodes of violence. In 2013, I wrote an essay for the Jonestown Report titled, the problem is totalism, not cults. Drawing on the work of Dick Anthony and Thomas Robbins, I suggested that scholars, quote, make pedagogical efforts to highlight that deception, manipulation, coercion, and violence are associated with totalistic groups, and to point out that totalistic social organizations range from isolated religious and ideological communities to prisons, concentration camps, and nations. End quote. So I think Rod and I would agree on this. In another article, I described a totalistic institution as one in which members are coerced and prevented from leaving. Perceived enemies internal or external to the group are attacked. Secondary leaders shore up and support a primary leader's domination and control. And rank and file members fail to think critically about their commitment to the group, its methods and goals. When relatives and anti-cultists have expressed concern about a religious group, they're usually concerned that the group may be a totalistic group under the control of a dictator aided and abetted by complicit lieutenants. Today, people are applying the word cult to the supporters of Trump, to the QAnon movement, to the racist white nationalist movement that I have heard, the Euro-American nativist millennial movement, and to its manifestation in the January 6th assault against the United States Congress. This signals a realization that movements that some people do not like are not necessarily small, isolated, and highly controlled groups. While racism and any type of bias propagated by politicians and media for their own benefit is deeply problematic and harmful, this does not make them a cult. 
problematic features of coercion, abuse, lying, and production of propaganda are not characteristics that are found only in small, isolated, conventional groups. But using the word cult suggests that this is the case. And furthermore, the word cult has been incorrectly um, applied and used to label groups that possess diverse characteristics with a pejorative stereotype. So uh, I definitely agree with Aaron's comment that um, in our scholarship, in our studies and writing and speaking about our findings, we need, we should strive to avoid labels, you know, stigmatizing labels, and also avoid category errors. I think that one's important. And lastly, I want to say that applying the pejorative term cult to groups of believers has itself caused harm and resulted in deaths. And I think, I believe that's the case for the Branch Davidians. And it's uh, been the case with other groups and movements. And uh, we see that very strongly uh, currently in the People's Republic of China. Now, I want to change my glasses here for a moment. And I want to look at my notes. So So Rod, in his presentation, stated that he's concerned with groups that um, uh, that you know do harm to people, and and I would say that I think all of us who are in the area, all of the scholars who are in the areas of religious studies, or rel new religions, excuse me, new religious movements, are generally in religious studies or the sociology of religion. Uh, we share the same concern. We're not. Um, um, we're not saying that harm does not occur uh, in some instances. Um, but I have a broader concern right now, <laughs> and that's with the use of media and the Rupert Murdoch empire of misinformation. I know it's caused, uh, it's continuing to cause harm to families and individuals, to democracy in the United States. It's my understanding it's caused similar harm, perhaps in the UK, perhaps in Australia. And so um, when Rod was saying that um, uh, he opposes the unethically um, manipulative techniques of persuasion and control, yeah, who wouldn't oppose that? But I think we've got a big problem on our hands in terms of national media or international media, and sometimes uh, smaller media on the smaller levels as well. But even though that's a serious, serious problem, I don't understand that as a cult. I don't think that's going to help us understand what's happening and what to do about it. So thank you. Fantastic. Thank you for your thoughts. Um, so I've got um, a few questions from the audience to ask, and if you have any questions, uh, you can either raise your hand um, using the little um, reaction button at the bottom of your screen, or you can either type a message in the chat box to everyone, um, and everyone can see who wrote it, or you can type a private message to me and I'll read it out, um, and no one needs to know your name. Um, so. Gosh, there's lots of things I found really interesting, but I'll start with the questions I got in. Um, one, of the, um, one of the questions is about the insider and outsider perspectives and how might scholars and other people who are involved in this field in a practical way, like therapists, um, grapple with this tension between the identities and preferred use of words by current and former members, um, and particularly when you've got the cultic or harmful behavior as the reason why some people have left the group. So um, I, I think that that was perhaps addressed by um, some of the speakers. Ed wants to jump in there. Go on then, Ed. I think, I think one of the things, just an immediate reaction to that question is that when we understand religions from an institutional perspective, um, it's, it's easy for leave takers and apostates when looking back at their experience um, and it's, 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 it's kind of difficult for them to contextualise their, as I was saying, contextualise their experience without referring to it as a cult. And when we look at it from an institutional point of view, 
what ends up happening is that it becomes it becomes part of a rhetoric war as opposed to actually understanding what really happened, which was in some cases there might have been a culture of bullying or abuse or something that had happened within an organisation, which is the direct result of individuals that have caused that to other individuals. When we have an institutional kind of perspective on understanding religion, what we what we run the what we run the potential of doing is suggesting that the religion itself is abusive or harmful, and then it excuses some individuals who've caused that harm. And so my approach to dealing with leave takers and apostates in my research has been to accept the fact that the word cult in the way that they use it is a popular usage of the word, um, and then also understand within my data analysis that what they're doing is they are referring to specific instances that happened. It does not mean that the beliefs of the religion and the rest of the individuals in that religion are abusive as well, if that makes sense. It was a gut reaction, sorry. That's great. Rod's going to jump in, which I think um, the idea of cultic behaviour is also quite interesting. Go on, Rod. Yeah, I just want to be clear that um, I would never say about any particular group, large or small, um, that all of the members uh, think and act and, and believe the same thing. I think there's a lot more heterogeneity in the groups than, than often is thought. Uh, and I think it really is important in that sense to pay attention to individuals. So I very much uh, always welcome uh, opportunities to speak with and, and actually listen to uh, people that are current members of groups that may have the label. But look, the, the issue here is the fact that uh, the cult term has explanatory value and should be used to call out totalism, um, as Catherine described it, wherever it's found. And there shouldn't be a kind of exceptionalist argument uh, for minority or new religions that somehow, because they might be being persecuted by certain states, uh, that somehow they, they're then immune uh, from uh, actually that scrutiny that should be applied to all organisations. And so the approach that's taken to secular organisations around health and safety and psychological well-being, uh, Aaron talked about, you know, could there be a gold standard for practices um, that already exist in most jurisdictions um, with regard to health and safety, but it is not applied uh, largely uh, to religious and political organisations, unless you work for the organisation, and even then quite loosely. So uh, I'm just making a call for a level playing field, uh, actually, that there shouldn't be exceptions to the notion that we shouldn't take seriously um, people when they report harms and when they report that they're being unethically manipulated. The idea that people should be instinctively disbelieved just because some people either within the organisation or others uh, besides don't agree with them, uh, seems to me, you know, to be both inconsistent, because on the other hand, you know, people argue that certain people from some organisations should be believed, but not if it's from a minority religion. Um, but it also, you know, defies the fact that the evidence is clear that people are coercively manipulated, that does affect them psychologically. And if that's happening in my organisation, I would want to do something about it. And I wouldn't hide behind my minority religious status, uh, and nor should anyone else try and provide that protection uh, if that indeed is happening. Thanks, Rod, for those clarifications. Uh, Mark Bramwell has his hand up. Do you want to? Yeah, just just quickly uh, to Rod. Um, I personally find this label cult pretty useless. But I think what you said at the end of your talk made more sense. Um, you said where harm is clear and evident called it out. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Um, but then we should look at individual cases rather than labeling particular groups, cults. I think that's really, doesn't really lead us anywhere. Call out those occasions when influence is undue. Yeah, should be called out and discussed and analyzed, etc. And government take action against cases. Yeah, again, I would agree. So we should look at individual cases rather than just labeling a mass of people as a cult, everybody in that movement as a cult. I do think it's rather useless. I just wanted to make that comment. Thanks, Can I just Rob. say that the use, the use of a term to, de to describe the phenomenon uh, doesn't mean that it applies to every single person uh, involved. 
And it seems that the term cult is singled out as being the only term that cannot be used um, to, to actually describe a phenomenon that has been documented significantly and extensively for decades, uh, because there's this suspicion that it, we're saying it to, to apply to everybody. I've never said that. ICSA doesn't say that. I've met very few people who ever have made that argument. I actually see that as the white elephant argument, that you, you know, I'm accused of trying to apply that to everyone, and therefore I shouldn't use the term. I use it to apply to groups, to apply to groups where the evidence is clear that unethical manipulation takes place, where that's been reported consistently, where psychological harm has been noted consistently. And those groups, whether they're minority religions, majority religions, political groups, etc., that should be what is called out. Now, that doesn't mean that the term cult then cannot be applied as a way of helping. It's like child abuse. Um, the fact that people now know a lot more about child abuse allows it to be called out. And I'm merely saying that the term cult affords that same ability for us to detect where that harm is happening and to deal with it. Thanks, Ron. Rod, um, this, uh, I, uh, there's another question on the same subject, which I'll, I'll allow, but I do want to um, not get completely stuck on this issue. So um, if anyone has any other questions about any of the other um, presentations, although this is, of course, the subject of the seminar. Um, but I mean, one of the issues is about these, a lot of the harms are actually criminal or illegal. Some of them that are more tricky to deal with cause significant harm, but aren't actually prosecutable under any law. Um, so what is the specific value of the word cult? Or another word that's coming recently, say, spiritual abuse, um, why is there a special context which make these words really useful or is the existing criminal legislation enough? Rod again. I didn't know whether you wanted me to come in on that. I know I've spoken a lot, so I don't want to overly dominate the, the conversation. But I think uh, uh, cult is a, is a useful grouping mechanism for a series of uh, aspects of criminality which um, are enshrined in different pieces of legislation. I don't think you actually have to have a law specifically about cults. And, and just to be clear, I do oppose uh, draconian government action uh, against groups in with the same ferocity as I oppose inaction against harm and abuse uh, in the same groups, um, because I don't believe that um, the, the, la the, the former is helpful. Um, so, you know, I think the fact that I, I think the term has explanatory value and helps to uncover abuse where it's happening, I don't think it's fair to then say that because that term is used badly um, by other people, but therefore I or anyone else that uses the term cult is somehow responsible for the FBI's decision to kill people uh, in Waco. I, I just don't think there's a the lineage there, uh, I'm afraid. But but I, I do agree that the, the term describes a multitude of issues, and we have coercive control laws in several jurisdictions. We have trafficking and modern slavery laws in a number of jurisdictions. Um, there's counterterrorism um, and security laws laws, all of which uh, apply to different aspects of the cult phenomenon and which can be used. Now, I think it would be helpful if those laws could be brought together uh, and applied more cohesively, um, such that uh, groups can be held account more successfully um, earlier um, down the line, what's referred to in the radicalization world as uh, upstream. Um, and to that extent, I think that, you know, we have a journey to go on. Um, and we do need the evidence. So I completely agree um, with Erin about the need to study conversion, deconversion. I think we do need um, more science. But just because we haven't got all of that yet does not mean that one should throw out the cult baby with the bathwater. So Ed and then Kathy both want to make a comment. Yeah, just Ed. sorry, very briefly. And I just want to double check that I am um, understanding what you're saying correctly, Rod, and again, I know that we don't want to get bogged down in this issue, but it sounds to me like, and maybe this is the psychological background, it sounds to me like you're referring to a group of behaviours as cult-ic or cult-ic rather than cult. And I wonder if we're 
potentially arguing the similar points or could argue similar points, I haven't argued it this evening, in that when we see abuses, when we see criminal actions, we should be calling it out. And I think there is a legitimate point here, or, um, well, all points are legitimate, but there is a point here to be made that actually sometimes scholars have fallen foul of not calling out abuses for fear of propagating a, a narrative that was being hijacked, a rhetoric, a narrative that was being hijacked by an anti-cult movement and sometimes a Christian cult movement. I just wonder if we are, we're kind of saying similar things, but then my question to you would be, rather than refer to it as cult, in the interest of being absolutely clear on what we're referring to, why would we not just call out abuse when it's abuse, call out trafficking when it's trafficking, and do away with the term cult from certainly how we use it in order to be crystal clear in what we're doing? Well, just very quickly in response uh, through the chair, I, do, I don't think that the term cult should be used loosely or carelessly. Uh, in fact, I use it sparingly myself. Um, I think there are cult-like practices, and I think there are my, my reason for thinking the term is useful is because it helps people identify when this is happening to them. It's like other forms of abuse. It helps people to know the signs, to be able to detect it, for them to be uh, investigated. But I very much agree, that, and I put it in my slides, there are lots of alternative terms that can be used. I'm not saying it's it's cult or forget it. I think the other terms can be used as well. And, you know, if Catherine wants to use the term totalist to group and that applies, you know, to some new religions, and I, I would ask the people that have said they're against the term cult, would you be comfortable using the term totalist to group and would you apply it to certain new religions where abusive practices have taken place? Psychopaths, traumatizing narcissists can occur in any organization, I agree. Um, but do you all agree that those people can and have led religious organizations as well as other forms? So, Cathy, briefly, and then I want to get some other questions in. Uh, unmute yourself, Cathy. Uh, yeah, I've studied. Um the whole some question of millennial movements and violence and or and again i always say episodes of violence i don't say that the members of groups always cause the violence mm -hmm. some plenty of times they are attacked but uh yes i mean we've i've watched donald trump for more than four years now and um and i agree that a narcissistic individual can cause a lot of harm you know and that was illuminating for me because i don't have a background in psychology but i think it it should be clear to everyone who's been paying attention the last four or five years but um but again i think starting out with the term cult cult has become a pejorative term and it's used in the news media it's used in so-called documentaries it's used in the anti-cult movement it's a pejorative term. It's, it's as pejorative as any kind of ethnic slur, ethnic slur or a sexist word or a homophobic word. I mean, we could think of all the ugly words. Cult is, is in that category. And so the, and it comes with a set of assumptions. It comes with ready made answers that are probably are, are, could well be incorrect. And so I say, and I strongly believe that starting out with the term cult is going to inhibit unbiased and open-minded investigation. And I've seen that happen with law enforcement agents. I've seen it happen with news reporters. And cult has just become a very popular word because it, as, we, as it has been mentioned, reporters like to have an easy answer. Uh, and um, law enforcement agents share the same biases that that you find in the wider society. So when scholars are using cult, oh, and a recent example of scholars using the word cult is a recent podcast that came out the last few days by a historian who's um, pretty well read right now in the United States anyway, Heather Cox Richardson. She summarizes the news every day. And uh, she and another historian um, did a segment on, on um, the people who assaulted the Capitol on January 6th as a, quote, cult. And they started out studying the village of Salem, 
and I think that was in 1692 when they had the um, with had the witch hunts and the accusations. They studied the Oneida perfectionists, and they and then of course they had to discuss Jonestown because Jonestown is the is the quote the epitome of a cult, and I agree that Jonestown was a totalistic community. However, none of those examples, and this is a this is um, an ex- it illustrates uh, category errors. None of the examples that they discuss uh, illuminate anything about the widespread movement, the nativist millennial movement that is revolutionary and that struck a blow on January 6th. So I, I do see Rod's hand up, but I, we're running out of time and I want to get into two different questions. Um, one, um, I'm going to um, take a phrase actually that Erin used in a talk she gave to the Harvard Divinity School, where she said, um, I, don't, I don't want people to be harmed by religion, but also not harmed because of their religion. And once cults gets applied to someone, it can, as Kathy was saying, be pejorative or the, the kid in the playground who was a cult member and, and be used in a exclusionary way or a way that causes further harm to an individual. So um, do any of the speakers have any comments about how to help an individual or an organization um, separate from this kind of sticky pejorative label? Can I just quickly say, and I know I've spoken a lot, but I just want to say that I agree that the term cult is pejorative and that the term cult is negative, and I would never say anything otherwise. That's why I use the term sparingly and carefully uh, to describe, uh, based on evidence, a cluster of evidence that shows uh, unethically manipulative techniques, harm that's been caused, the the influence... um, uh, of a psychopath or traumatizing narcissist. And I think it should be carefully applied. And I, I agree about uh, the, the careless use uh, of the term um, in the media. Uh, but that doesn't mean to say that the term should not be used to, to call out those instances where the evidence is clear and and to help detect harm where it's happening. Uh, and I think that the balance becomes slightly wrong, I think, if one is arguing that the ability to be able to believe something trumps taking seriously uh, when people are being harmed um, in a particular environment. And one shouldn't trump the other. Uh, And I've never argued that it should. Does anyone have any answers to how to avoid, um, how to get get away from the pejorative once it's been applied to you? Um, Or you've you've been othered by that term, either as a collective group or an individual? It's quite a hard question, but... Don't see any of the speakers volunteering. Um, Kim's had her hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just want to ask um, Alice and Ed a question, and uh, it's about this course, but it picks up on something that Philip said about um, her word cult being full of complex, shifting meaning. Um, my own doctoral research is about ethical belief, and I'm uh, doing a digital ethnography with Stephen. And uh, something it really interests me is the way in which this cult rhetoric is used against vegan. Um, there is a lot of uh, anti-vegan discourse on social media. And, um, you know, cult in this sense is used to um, think of people as dangerous or extreme or as the wrong type of religious or, or whatever. Um, and just thinking about that, um, Alice and Ed, you, you talked about um, uh, COVID cult, so-called. Um, and I was wondering, when, when people are talking about the COVID cult, as they did when they um, hijacked your Facebook um, page, um, what meaning do you think that those people are bringing to the word cult? Do you want to go first, Ed? Go for it, Ed. I've already spoken. Okay. Um, uh, f- thanks for that, Kim. I'm so- uh, sorry, the, your, your signal was breaking up a little bit. So I think I, oh, I, I no, 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 that, that, that's fine. I think I caught the gist of what you were saying. You were saying about um, w- what does it mean for the people who are hijacking the term regarding COVID? Am I right? Yeah, just what meaning you think they are attributing. It, it might be difficult to generalise, but um, you know, mm. what, uh, what are the meanings, the complex meanings for them? 
Well, I, I personally think it's it's a sign of um, this conversation that we've been having this evening about the power of the term, the pejorative nature of the term. Um, a, a lot of it is to simply ridicule another perspective. Um, a lot of the comments, if you look at them, are written in a very um, blasé way um, that um, the word cult is being used to diminish or to belittle something. But it also implies that the people, uh, so you know, some of the comments say that um, the cult has resulted in people having the jab put in them. Um, it's it's positioning certain behavior or certain actions as not only morally wrong, but also that the people doing it don't realize what they're doing. It that um, these people commenting have access to an understanding of COVID that um, the, that um, people getting vaccinated don't have. Um, so I, I personally, uh, I, the way I see it is that a lot of it is about political arguments and uh, controlling political narratives. Mm. Okay. I don't know if Ed wants to jump in there. Um, uh, just very briefly, I think a cursory glance, I def we definitely need to do a lot more analysis on the comments. Two really interesting observations I've been able to make so far, which may help you, is that number one, these people aren't filling the survey out. They are on the comments and they are getting involved in these, in these debates, but their views don't seem to be translating into the views that are going into the survey. And so that says, potentially says to me, and again, this is very early, early kind of days in the, in the data, is that one of the ways in which people are using the term is by belittling others, they are trying to empower themselves because the rhetoric that they are using is, well, I've not fallen for that. I've not fallen victim to the cult of COVID. I'm clever. I'm smart. And I think that kind of self-empowering, um, my research is on empowering empowerment and conversion. And, and I think what we're seeing is people trying to find sources of empowerment and the types of people, and I have to be very hesitant here because I, I haven't stalked all their Facebook profiles, but the types of people that would use the term in order to uh, empower themselves, they must therefore, by definition, be being disempowered in other areas of their life, whether that be social status, work, family life, whatever it is. And so I think there is a source of empowerment that comes from using the term cult and then what they believe to be accurately firing that term across as something other to what they they think. And I think it's the same with vegan culture. I've seen some of that with my wife being vegan, Facebook comments with people, well, well I eat meat. Well, okay, great. Well, that doesn't really make a difference to anyone's life other than their, their own life by making that statement. And I think it's about self-empowerment as well. Okay, so I... Oh, this event was supposed to stop six minutes ago, but it's a fa fantastic, fascinating conversation. I'm going to try to have no more than five more minutes. Um, I see Gordon's got his hand up, Paul Ford's got his hand up, and um, I'm, I might slip in one more question. We'll see how much how much time those two comments takes. Um, go on, Gordon. Uh, thank you. Uh... I just have a, a couple of remarks about we, in terms of of helping people who who have been accused of being a cult for no good reason uh, get away from it. Uh, there are a number of things that we did over the years. Where, for example, in the '90s, one of the reasons that the derogatory use of the word cult occurs in the newspaper is that that is when the newspaper education started educating young reporters on not using that term loosely. And over the 1990s, uh, we actually saw a, a big decline in newspapers and in uh, television reports about different groups shying away from the use of the term cult uh, just because someone had called the group that was in the news a cult. Uh, that's a very, very important thing. Uh, uh, I have been trying to uh, deal with people uh, who are willing to go into court and say, this group is a cult. And they have never studied the group. They have no idea of how the group may or may not fit any particular definition of a cult. 
and uh, we've, we have tried to prevent that from happening. So those are the uh, kinds of things that can be done. Thanks, Gordon. So um, I see Kathy has her hand up as well. I'm going to let Paul um, say what he wants to say and then give Kathy the very last word um, before calling it to a close. Thanks. Yeah, hi, hi everybody. I hope you can hear me, and uh, uh, you know, thank you uh, for the uh, the presenters this evening in, 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 in really kind of contributing to this conversation. And I guess I should apologise because I think that um, you know, it's a point for me to actually ask a question rather than give a statement. Um, so, so my, my my perspective is simply this: I am a a survivor of uh, of a cult. Um, I recognise that there is a scholarly debate about the term, I, I look at it rather simplistically. Uh, and my definition in relation to you know, a cult is, is one that causes huge uh, and significant emotional harm to an individual, uh, restricts them and uh, provides uh, a number of connotations that's outside you know, societal norms. And I guess, you know, from my, my perspective here, we cannot be apologists for uh, organizations and groups that uh, within the mandate of them uh, as an organization seek to cause harm to uh, whether it be you know, young people, the most vulnerable uh, through manipulative uh, techniques. And so the point I'm making is that, you know, within society, not within the scholarly, uh, the, scholarly uh, the world, but the, 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 the concept of a cult should be one that is retained for those organizations and groups that cause harm, that sit outside uh, of values, our values and shared values and set outside of our, our norms. It is a very useful label to assist uh, law enforcement agencies, to assist you know, those that work in social work and social services and, and other, and other organisations to identify those people that are most at risk of, of harm. And for that reason, I do think there's a strong case to retain that label, uh, as Rod said earlier, in the minority of cases for those organisations that sit outside of uh, societal norms. Thank you, Paul, for voicing that. That's um, great to, to get a survivor's perspective. Um, Kathy, can you um, wrap up the event as well as whatever you wanted to say, please? Well, I just wanted to also address the question of what can a group do if, they, if they've been labeled a cult and they don't want to be labeled a cult? And the advice I always give, and I know Gordon gives this advice and, and Eileen also, I'm sure, is to open yourself up uh, to people to come and visit, get to know you. If you're under investigation for something, cooperate with the investigation. Just don't keep yourself closed off uh, from society and whoever it is that has uh, questions about what the group is doing. And uh, and so that's that's all I wanted to mention is that, and I saw in the chat somebody said well improve your pr well yeah the group can improve its pr but that involves reaching out to people and communicating with people and opening the channels of communication so, that's all fantastic thank you kathy so I'm going to draw the event to a close because we've run over time, but these are really fascinating discussions um, and it's great that we had a variety of perspectives and understandings of the term. It's great that some of the more positive uses of cult and popular culture were mentioned, as well as the way it may or may not be a useful term in certain contexts um, to describe certain types of harmful behaviour um, or might be used as a term of abuse. Um, there's a lot more discussion to be have. I don't know if we'll ever reach um, Edward and Edward's ambition of, of getting a single term under which we can all unite behind. Um, but I think we can all clarify our own understandings through these discussions. And I really appreciate you all from being here. Um, there's a link to Alid and Ed's um, survey in both the chat and in um, informed social media, um, which you're very welcome to distribute. They're really interested in anyone's opinion worldwide on what these words mean. Um, and it's really interesting to bring up the kind of post newspaper age up to date, this, this being spread on social media, because um, journalists no longer have the, the control of our terms to the extent they once did. Um, so thank you all for coming. Um, thank all the speakers for their um, really thoughtful and well-produced um, presentations that kept to time. That's really hard to do. Um, and thank all the audience members for being here. Um, do email inform if you have any 
thoughts, comments, um, uh, congratulations, criticism. We want to hear it. Um, and uh, have a good evening. Thank you.